Hey, how's it going everybody? Drew Creel here. In this video, what I'm going to do is refute some of the commonly held misbeliefs in the guitar community. The gloves are coming off. You're not gonna wanna miss this. Okay, so I'm gonna start off by explaining why I wanted to do this video. So I wanted to do this video because I keep seeing these clickbait titles, these, these videos centered around these taboo topics in the guitar community. So these are things that come from people like Levi Clay who tells you to stop practicing your scales or like Glenn Fricker who tells you to stop writing a bunch of riff salad music to try to name one song written on seven or eight string guitar that's famous. Or don't play exercises on your guitar, just play more music. If I sort of give my, myself an assessment, uh, no, I'm not a famous guitar player. No, um, I, I, I don't think I'm the best guitar player but I'm pretty darn good at guitar and I can play a variety of styles. I've released several videos on this channel playing some of the most difficult guitar content ever recorded. And no, I'm not saying that as a brag, I'm saying that as like, yeah, it was really hard, it sucked. Part of it I didn't enjoy, but today I, I have something to stand on and something that I'm proud of. Another thing I'll mention is that those videos that I have out there playing some hard, challenging guitar content have very little views. We're talking a couple hundred views. But you know what, when I play a pink drum set a uh, hundred miles an hour, I play death metal on a pink drum set that was made for a little girl. Well, then I'm gonna get 4.6 million views. So so obviously you can see people really don't care how good at guitar you are, right? I can I can sort of understand why Glenn Fricker would say, you just need to write a good song. Focus on writing a good song. I think when it comes to music creation, you really have to think about what kind of music you really are passionate about in your heart, okay? And what your goals are. So if your goal is to be a famous pop artist, well, then start studying and start learning how to write amazing pop songs. You might even have to learn how to produce a heck of a lot better to get a good demo going, right? But for me personally, as a guitar player, I'm not interested in making pop music. I'm not interested in, in becoming famous, so to speak. What I am interested in doing is making music that comes from my heart, that connects to people around me. So your goals can be different from mine. That's just the path that I choose. So Glenn Fricker telling people to stop writing a bunch of riff salad, Sounds like you're a pop engineer. You're very anti-metal for a metal producer. Well, hey, Carl, uh, here's a clue. Most of the best metal songs are still pop songs at their core. They have verses, they have choruses, they've got hooks, and they've got very memorable melody lines. That's why you can listen to a song like Breaking the Law, Living After Midnight, Panama, or a myriad of others and instantly remember that <laughs> song because they're f***ing memorable. They're not just a bunch of boring f***ing riff salad. Here's an interesting point. Uh, when we were tracking drums on the second Woods album. We were doing Summer's Envy and I said that to Dave after they got done finished, you know, the bed tracks. I'm like, am I hearing a bit of pop in that? And if you listen to that track, that is essentially a black metal pop song because it has hooks and memorable melodies, that kind of stuff. It just had the core elements. It's all about how it's presented and the attitude. That's what makes it metal. It's not just, you know, mindless chugging on an open eighth string. That's just fucking boring. We have descended once again to the ninth level of hell, which is listening to your riff salad for four whole minutes, because you had to do the whole four minutes every time. You had to go all the way. You had to push the pineapple all the way in. No mercy for Trey, who just wanted to give away a nice amp to somebody who could write a song. No, I have to listen to all four minutes of your riff salad instead. Hey girl, are you a waitress? Because I didn't order this riff salad i just find that to be very misleading and and very um one-sided okay and that's also a logical fallacy so he's assuming that his viewership just wants to uh get famous and write awesome songs that are pop oriented well there's several amazing artists out there that i love that do 
have very complex songs. Okay, Humanity's Last Breath, for example. Spastic Inc., Meshuggah, the list goes on and on and on with, with different bands that you could probably boil their music down to a bunch of riff salad, which is a, ch a super cheap way of characterizing uh, music. I, I could take you know an Archspire song and tear it apart as a riff salad, right? But we know that it's not. It's a brilliantly put together piece of classically inspired gent music that makes our brains want to explode, right? And in fact, in their music video that they put out recently, their brains do explode, and I think that's really cool. So the first commonly held misbelief that I want to cover is this whole push on YouTube to stop practicing scales. Stop practicing scales. Learn to play phrases. Learn to play music. Learn actual music, right? You hear it all the time. What I find incredibly funny is that even in his own video about stop practicing scales, Levi Clay admits to having practiced a lot of scales in his lifetime. He's, he admits to playing tons and tons of scales and that he knows his scales very well. So why is he telling you to stop practicing your scales? Well, I think what he's trying to say is that your scales don't exist in a vacuum. If you're never using your scales to create music, you're missing the point, right? And uh, I just wish that more YouTubers would put that in the video title or something like that. But uh, that's just the game, man. We're here, to, we're here to get clicks and we're here to get people to click on our video to watch it. Hopefully you clicked on mine and you're still here and you're enjoying watching it. So from my experience with practicing scales, scales really helped me dial in my technique. It also helped me understand uh, harmony and, and construction. So a lot of people just associate scale practice with you know, starting at the lowest note of the scale and going to the top and then back again and then moving to the next mode right, and doing the same thing. Well, there are other ways to play scales. How about playing scales horizontally on one string at a time? Now play two strings at a time with a scale. Now play three. Now play four strings on a scale. So when you get to that point, you're actually playing really interesting harmonic stuff with your guitar, right? That's something that's missing from this scale discussion. And I plan on doing future videos where I'm demonstrating how to play horizontal scales, how to play chord scales and things of that nature. That's really how you develop your harmonic language. By learning scales, it helps you learn where all the notes are on your guitar. And if you're trying to play particularly challenging music, maybe you're trying to play some neoclassical shred like our boy Ing Ingui. If you are, you're pretty much going to have to practice your scales nonstop in order to get your playing and your technique. Can you play 16th notes at 150 beats per minute? If you can't, Find a scale and start ramping up the speed and try to practice it. So learning a scale, uh, you know, whether it be a three note per string, four note per string scale, or two note per string scale, learning a scale can actually help you increase your speed, improve your technique, and get your dexterity on point so you can actually enter the arena of playing extreme music like death metal, gent music, progressive metal, neoclassical shred, all of that stuff that I love. For me to even set foot in the gladiators arena of titans, I had to practice the crap out of my scales, and you should too. So get to practice, man. Get to your scales. Okay, another commonly held misbelief similar to scales is stop practicing exercises. Exercises don't work. And I am here to tell you that that's not true. It's just simply not true, okay? There are several key exercises that I can point to in my guitar playing career that have helped push me into uh, a another area. The first one that comes to mind is these things called Segovia slurs. Even Andreas Segovia uh, practiced his legato exercises, right? So he came up with this thing called the Segovia slurs, and what it does is it helps create rhythm from your left hand. So we know that guitar playing involves rhythmic stuff, maybe if you're playing with a pick with your right hand or finger style rhythm, right? Rhythm exists here but it also exists between the fingers of your left hand. So if you want to be a good guitarist, just work on the right hand or something like that, right? If you want to be a great guitarist, practice the Segovia slurs and work on getting finger independency, uh, high level dexterity with your left hand legato playing. So prior to me working on a lot of Alan Holdsworth content, several years ago, I, I learned how to play the solo Devil Take the Hindmost. I learned how to play the solo low levels high stakes which are some of the hardest guitar solos 
of all time, at least according to Steve Vai and several other guitar heroes. Um, so while I was working on that, I became very frustrated with where I was at with my legato playing. So what I, what I did is I talked to my guitar teacher, my guitar mentor at the time, and he told me about the Segovia slurs. And I, I did those diligently on every string. They're very frustrating exercises to play, but they will make you an absolute monster legato player with your left hand. So that's just one exercise that I can pinpoint that will, will severely help your, uh, your technique and get you playing guitar like you never have before. Okay, so the third commonly held misbelief in the guitar community that I want to address here today is that famous metal songs are actually just pop songs that are more aggressive. So quit making a bunch of riff salad and write a good song. So this is something that Glenn Fricker um, and even Trey Xavier say a lot on their YouTube channels. And by the way, I'm just gonna preface this by saying I watch their YouTube channels regularly. They're both great uh, YouTubers and they, they offer up a lot of fantastic information. But what I'm finding is that not everything they say is true and you should take some of the things they say with a grain of salt. So that's why I made this video just to provide a different perspective on these topics. Glenn Fricker, in one of his FAQ videos, references you know songs like Breaking the Law or Crazy Train as these these pop songs that that you know you could characterize them as metal songs, but they're really pop songs that are just aggressive and there's attitude. And he was saying how the attitude of the musician is more important than you know, how many riffs you write or how many notes you play. And I think he might be right in some regards. Like I said earlier in this video, it just depends on what your goals are. Are you trying to become a, a pop artist or something? Or are you trying to fuse pop music and metal like so many artists have done in the past, Spirit Box being one of them, right? That's probably why they're one of the more popular metal bands today. But it simply depends on what your goals are. Okay, so for me personally, I'm not trying to fuse pop and metal. Okay, I have no interest in that. What I'm trying to do with my music is make something that I'm proud of, that I love to listen to. I'm just trying to make music that I want to listen to. Okay, and if you like it too, that's great. Okay, that means that we are connecting on some kind of wavelength. Okay, and I, that gets me excited. I'm not trying to be anything I'm not. Okay. And I'm sure there is some pop music in my in my brain floating around and, and becomes a part of how I write music. That entire discussion should just hinge upon what your goals are. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to make, you know, a 90s death metal record? Or are you trying to make a super hi-fi deathcore record that has a ton of cool breakdowns? It just depends on what you're trying to do. The fourth and final commonly held misbelief in the guitar community that I want to address here is this thing that people throw out a lot. It's name a famous seven string riff or name a famous song that was written on an eight string guitar. And I just think that's an incredibly unfair and just crappy thing to say. And I find it funny because the people that are propagating this type of thinking are the same people that uh, that make seven string and eight string music and that make that have a YouTube channel built on uh, you know heavy metal guitar playing and stuff like that. So I just find that incredibly interesting. So just to remind everyone, the seven string guitar didn't come out until 1990. Okay, so it's only been around for 30 years or so. Steve Vai rolled that guitar out in the early 90s. Everyone hated it right away. Then by the mid 90s, people like Brian Head Welsh and Monkey from Korn were picking up seven string guitars at a discount at their local music stores and playing them and making amazing music with them. So I just find that uh, incredibly interesting. If you just put things in a, in a time perspective, you know, seven string guitar has been around for 30 years. It's not that much time. The eight string guitar from a production standpoint has really only been around since 2008, okay? So 2008, Ibanez released the RG2228 electric guitar, and it was a mass-produced guitar made in Japan, a finely, finely made guitar. If you can find one today, just snatch it up right away. They're great. Ibanez rolled out their eight-string guitars in 2008, okay? Or two, maybe 2007. Now, have eight strings been around before 2008? Of course, but you had to custom order one. You had to call up. Conklin guitars and have them make one and it usually would cost you about four thousand dollars Which was a lot of money in the 1990s and early 2000s So I consider the beginning of the eight string guitar as 2008 so that's really only about 15 years that uh, Eight string guitars have been in production. So 
Once again, I find that incredibly unfair uh, to, to just throw that around that, oh, name one song written on a seven string, that's, that's cool. So what I'm going to do now is name several famous metal songs that use seven and eight string guitars. So Blind by Korn, it's the first single by Korn uh, written on seven string guitars. It has the most crushing uh, beginning of a song that you could probably ask for. It's still to this day probably Korn's most famous uh, song. So Bleed by Meshuggah, you guys remember that? Obzen when that came out in around 2008. It's the most technical, groovy, crushing, um, experimental metal song that's ever been released. And guess what? It's all on eight-string guitar, and it's Meshuggah's highest played uh, song to this day on all platforms. Another example, maybe not so famous, is Swerve City by the Deftones. Okay, so Stephen Carpenter from the Deftones has been using seven strings since the 90s and playing in you know very low tunings throughout his career with the Deftones. The Deftones write very very catchy music that I would not I would not characterize it as pop music. Okay, I would characterize it as ambient metal, hard rock, emotional metal, emotional rock, visceral metal music. I've seen the Deftones a handful of times incredible band. Definitely go check them out and see them. They're continuing to make music that's better and better every year. The last example, I believe, came out in 1992 on Dream Theater's Awake record. It's a song called Caught in a Web that uh, features the seven string guitar. John Petrucci, right away in the early 90s, picking up the seven string. Ibanez gives him a seven string. He's utilizing it um, right away as of Dream Theater's second uh, commercial record awake. So thank you so much for watching my video on these four commonly held misbeliefs in the guitar community. I really enjoyed uh, talking about this stuff. Hopefully I was able to provide an alternative perspective on these topics. And by the way, I just wanted to say I love Glenn Fricker, Levi Clay, uh, Trey Xavier. I watch all of those guys on a regular basis. I think their channels are all great. I aspire to create content um, as good as the stuff that they make or even better one day, we'll see. But I just wanted to share my kind of two cents, my perspective. So practice your scales, practice your exercises. Um, don't worry about making famous metal music because metal music isn't famous anyway. Keep shredding on your seven and eight string guitar, okay? So have a great day wherever you're at. Goodbye, and I'll see you in the next one.